afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. The Vermont Monitoring Cooperative was established in 1996 as a partnership between the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources, the USDA Forest Service, and the University of Vermont. Since then, the group has expanded into a regional cooperative, and a recent name change highlights that. Now called the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative, or FEMC, the group conducts monitoring and acts as a clearinghouse for information about forested ecosystems in the Northeast. To find out more, I'm joined by Jim Duncan and Jen Pontius. Jim is the director of FEMC, and Jen is a principal investigator for the group and a researcher for the U.S. Forest Service. Thanks so much for coming in. Thanks Thank for you. having us, Judy. So tell us about the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative. What is it that you do? So the cooperative is a partnership among the northern New England and New York states. And we're really focused on understanding forest health change and communicating that information out to the people who need it. So we work with our cooperators to think about forests pretty broadly, not just what the trees are doing, but from soils to sky, what's happening with soil health, water quality, and everything in between. Mm -hmm. And we do this to advance uh, our partners' needs for understanding what uh, challenges they face with forest ecosystems in the region. Mm -hmm. And so, Jen, how about you? Yeah, I think that what the founders of the then Vermont Monitoring Cooperative saw was that there were a lot of people doing really good work around the forests and forest health issues. At the time, that was red spruce decline. But all of these researchers and land managers, state and federal organizations, they were really good at communicating within their own organizations, but not so much across those boundaries or across disciplines. And so that's really the niche that the BMC and now the FBMC fills is bringing these people together so that we can share information and also find efficiency and synergy in the work that we continue to do. And so there have been some big changes at FEMC in the past year or so, starting with the name. What was behind all the changes, and what's going on now, Jim? So uh, as we were starting out at the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative, we did a great job looking at some really challenging issues, such as acid deposition, mercury deposition, what was happening with amphibians. And we looked at pretty isolated spaces in Vermont, and that was really critical for the time. But as, a, uh, as we solved some of those issues, or at least got some understanding, the next set of challenges that we're starting to face are much broader, and looking at just sites in Vermont or even just in Vermont in general um, wasn't uh, going to answer those questions anymore. So after um, looking at the situation, we started reaching out to partners in other states, um, seeing what their interests were and needs were for a cooperative model. Could we take what we've learned in Vermont and bring it out to this wider group? Mm -hmm. And we really uh, got some great in input and started working on some of the needs of the states. And after about a year and a half, it was clear that we were starting to meet those goals. And uh, we made the name change to recognize this broader cooperative that we have started to put together. Why was it important to extend the cooperative from just focusing on Vermont to a larger area? Well, as I mentioned, the challenges now are more complex, but also the number of people who benefit from this information is even greater. And so just keeping what we can understand in Vermont here, even, it's great, but we want to get that information out to other people, and we need partnerships and cooperation from other states to get that understanding. Mm -hmm. um, so we've, uh, for example, convened some uh, of our stakeholders in a meeting in December and identified some of the key forest health issues that they see as pressing at a regional scale, things like fragmentation, um, things like climate change around phenology and different um, pest outbreaks. So mm -hmm. there's some key issues that would be great if they could spend their time onto the state agency or at their university, but they're kind of limited in their scope, and that's a place that the cooperative can step in and help support them at a more regional scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, those state boundaries really are artificial. Forest threats don't know uh, political boundaries, so it really seemed important that we actually start tackling these issues for the forest on a regional scale. Mm -hmm. Can you give me some examples of some of these threats? Yeah, so I would say the biggest one we're facing right now really is climate change, and not just in terms of the warming that we generally think of, but the extreme events. So I don't know if people um, even remember the October 30th windstorm that we had. That's just one yeah, example. Yeah, we were without power for, for, for a few days. I <laughs> yeah. definitely yeah. remember that. <laughs> yeah, and so this is something that is, is normal, and, and forest dynamics mm. are built to recover after events like this, but when they come more frequently and with higher intensity, it's something that the forests are not necessarily adapted to. So I, I really do think that climate change is going to be a pressing issue moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, you're a principal investigator with the cooperative. What does that entail? Yeah, so my role as PI is to guide the mission of the organization, um, to make sure we have high quality and ensure the scientific merit of any of the products we develop, and to also work to continue the funding for the organization. But I find that because we're governed by a steering committee, a regional steering committee, that I spend a lot of my time just listening to our partners and hearing what their forest health issues in their corners of the world, what their real um, concerns are. Are they similar to 
to our concerns? It, it actually does vary. I mean, I think everyone has some of the big ideas, the big players like climate change on their radar, but other states really do find that they're concerned about specific species that might be of interest to their timber industry or um, particular uh, kyle elevation sites that might be for a particular wildlife species they're concerned about. So there really are some differences as well. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's not just trees, though, that you're concerned with. Yeah, that's right, Judy. We really try to think of forest health as more than just the trees, but as an entire ecosystem and how that system functions. So, for example, the forests provide wildlife habitat. They provide clean air and clean water. Um, they're a timber resource. So we really try to think about the services that the forests provide. But then we also are careful to make sure we're looking at the actual stress agents, those threats. So can we be looking at air pollution levels, acid deposition, climate? Because the idea is if we take this more holistic look, the sort of systems approach to, the, to monitoring the health of the ecosystem, um, we'll be able to understand not just when it's changing and what's changing, but also what's driving those changes. And so, uh, Jim, what are some of the other projects that FEMC is involved with or has been involved with? Sure, it, <clears throat> it runs a range, mm -hmm. um, but we've been lucky to have some really great input from states on what kind of needs they have. And one of the more mundane, but actually kind of exciting ones that we've done recently is we went to New York and we actually pulled out old maps from the 50s or 60s of where forest tent caterpillar has been defoliating forests in New York. And we got those all into a digital standard format so we could look across time. Our record used to be about 20 years, mm -hmm. what we could do digitally. And this brought us back another 50 years um, in terms of time that we could look and see where these infestations are recurring and how intense they are over time. And that uh, data really is at risk of being lost. So we got this uh, great product in and of itself, but then we could feed this into other projects that we're doing. We have what's called the Northeastern Forest Health Atlas that provides over a century of forest uh, damage mapping across the region. And we can also feed it into what we're calling the Forest Indicators Dashboard. So how can we summarize some of these um, key ecosystem data sets over time and look at trends and how this year is doing. So these types of uh, data rescue projects, data access projects, these are things that our partners keep coming back to us with. They're things they don't have time to do themselves right now, but they would love to see done, mm -hmm. and that's something FEMC can step in and do. And how can that some of that information help with what's happening now? I know that there's a, a forest tent caterpillar outbreak that's been happening, um, and so how does having this data help with the with current situation? Sure. Well, one of the first steps whenever you're evaluating the impact of something is you have to find out what you already know, what information you already have access to. And it can be easy in some cases to go get the information if you know it already exists in a great format, but sometimes it's not. Or you may think you've already gotten all the data that available about a topic but you haven't. So something like uh, forest pest damages, like forest and caterpillar, understanding where stands have been defoliated in the past is important, and understanding maybe why a stand is more susceptible to an outbreak this year could have as much to do with drought, with climate indicators, um, other drivers that make that particular stand susceptible this time around. And is it sort of heartening, too, to maybe say, well, look, this stand had an infestation years ago, but it's fine. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think the resilience in our forest is something that we got to take Pride, not pride in, but we got to be excited about. We do have resilient forests to some mm -hmm. of these outbreaks. We've had these pests here for centuries in some cases. So. And I know that um, you know you, you talked about the windstorm and some of the damage that was done in, in the forests. Um, some people say, well, isn't that just nature taking its course and should we just leave the trees down and not even worry about it? Yeah, that absolutely is a part of forest natural dynamics. Gap, small gap dynamics are how our forests look the way they do, why we have so many different species and so many different size classes. Um, and so the forest is designed to function like that. But again, the question is, are we starting to see these with more frequency? And when they come, are they having a greater impact on the forest over larger areas? So it may be impacting the ability of the forest to recover as quickly, or it could result in a forest that looks different than it has historically. Mm -hmm. And Jen, can you give me some examples of some of the other projects projects that you're involved with? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the really exciting things about this new direction we're going by being a regional organization is that we've uh, adjusted our staff so that we can be really nimble and efficient to respond directly to our cooperator needs. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, you know, if we had a, a research co cooperator who had a, a whole bunch of dendrochronology data, uh, data that would be Shelley Rayback, mm -hmm. and she wanted to be able to pull all that together and link that to site factors so she could understand what's driving the growth of forests, um, we can do that. We can actually build that database for her. So we've become really very nimble um, and are actively soliciting projects from our partners to see what they need and what they maybe can't do in-house that we could provide those services. So it's a really exciting time. 
So what do you hear from, from your partners as far as what they're looking for as far as information? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest things is that, again, people have been doing this work and monitoring the forest for decades. And a lot of that information is buried in file cabinets. Some of it was lost during the flooding that we had back yeah. during Irene. Um, and so really that data rescue piece, it's not very sexy, but it's mm -hmm. such an important piece because we can't predict how the forests are going to respond or change in the future unless we can look back and see how they've responded historically. So getting that, all of that data together and bringing it in one place and making it accessible so that everybody can share that and build their models, um, that becomes a really important piece of information for people. So not necessarily se sexy, but data rescue is really where it's at. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we do see this coming up over and over again. I think also we're seeing state agencies have retirement waves coming up and a lot of the people who've spent their lives working up this body of knowledge and maybe have an idiosyncratic understanding of it also have it in those paper files and they are ex interested in seeing that carried on when they leave and so I think our partners are recognizing that there's this a stable resource that can provide that service for that uh, for that need so so the information is out there somewhere in mm -hmm. someone's desk yes. and so what you're trying to do is track it down even if we just tell people where is, that there is a resource out there that's, that could be scanned and digitized and done something could, somebody could do something with it, that's uh, hard to do right now. You don't know who has what in the desk drawers. We're at least trying to get a little bit more of a map to where all this information is. So now who uses this information? What do they use it for? It's a great question. Um, the biggest user of this is probably the research community because it assembles a data set that they need to be able to do this modeling, do this prediction work. But the other big group is uh, land managers and planners. So people who are thinking about how to manage their particular resource. So we've heard from the Green Mountain National Forest, they use our annual reporting and our long-term summary as summaries of trends as kind of a key uh, backbone on which to build their management planning. So it can really provide a larger context to some of these specific planning activities that state and agency and federal agency folks have to do. And then the last group is educators. It's a great resource for people who want to expose their students to data, to how to analyze data, and how to compare between different methods and different collections. And what about like cities and towns? Would they contact you and say, we've got an issue in this forested part of our town that we're concerned about? Is that something that could happen? It has. We've, we've actually done some urban in, uh, forest inventory at the request of uh, uh, the city of Winooski and the city of Burlington um, back when we, were for the, when we were the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative. Mm -hmm. So there's been this interest in what is the state of our urban forest and can you help us figure out how to measure this? So we were able to bring in the university students, do service learning, and also some of the research capacity that we can tap into at UVM. So Jen, what are some of the things that we do know about long-term health of forests in Vermont and around the Northeast? Yeah, as Jim mentioned, we really are incredibly lucky that forests in the Northeast are incredibly resilient. So when I say resilient, I mean we can have decline or disturbance events, and the forest will sort of reorganize and uh, regain its structure and function relatively quickly. So for you know, looking at forests globally, we really are lucky to have that. Um, but at the same time, we are faced with more stress agents, more threats than we maybe ever have been in the past. And so this becomes a really important time to make sure that we're monitoring um, for change, that we can see changes when they're, happen when they're happening. Maybe there are some species that are doing better than other species. And then really get that information out to the land managers so that we can figure out how we can best work together to manage this sustainably to the future. And one of the things that we have done trying to get exactly at that question, how healthy are the forests, is we have pulled together this forest health indicators dashboard that we've been working on. And that really does what FEMC does best. Best. We've brought together all of these different long-term data sets that quantify the forest structure, forest condition, the services the forests provide. And then we use all of those different metrics to come up with a score, almost like a grade, how healthy is the forest. Mm -hmm. And that allows us to have something a little more quantitative so we can see how things are changing long-term. Um, and then also allows us to dig into those individual metrics. So that's something that should be coming live from us online uh, relatively soon. Now, FEMC hosted an annual conference which took place at UVM about a month ago. What was uh, the theme of the conference this year, Jim? The theme was Beyond Communication, so it's advocating for science in our forests. Mm -hmm. um, so the goal was really to take our uh, great theme, a great conference where we have lots of people attending a morning plenary and give them a topic that kind of pushes them a little bit further out of their comfort zone. Scientists are great about communicating information in statistics and peer-reviewed papers and reports, but distilling that out to the key audiences that need to get that information in the right way is something that we hear people are struggling with constantly. So we set up a, a conference that really tried to 
show them some examples in the morning, give them some structure to think about communicating to different audiences, and then workshops in the afternoon that help them hone those skills or refine um, practicing for, say, the media or for a policymaker, mm -hmm. and how do you craft your message differently for those two. So uh, we tried to tie those together throughout the day, and then in the middle provided um, what we usually do, which is contributed talks on the latest science and monitoring results that people are finding from around the region. If our viewers are interested in getting more information about FEMC, what should they do? Uh, the easiest way is to go to the website. It's www www.uvm.edu slash FEMC, or you can Google FEMC, and uh, check out all the resources that we have there. We have all of our conferences from past years. A lot of our products are quickly accessible from the front page. Well, thank you both for joining me today. Yeah, thank thank you. you for having us, Judy. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.